So today we're going to be looking at a really nice kind of differential equation. First order, meaning that the highest derivative is a first derivative, linear differential equation. Now you see the word linear a lot, and it just is a, a really cool property. Essentially, when you think about linear, there's two nice things about things which are linear. Namely, there's some sort of respecting of addition, and the other thing is that it respects what's called scaling. And uh, we're going to get more into why linear is nice, but that's for another day. So for right now, we should just know linear means nice. And in particular, when we talk about a first order linear differential equation, it has the nice form y prime plus some function of x times y equals some function of x. And so it's linear with respect to y. Just notice that there's nothing fancy going on with the y. There's no y cubes. There's no sine of y. It's just y and y prime. And then there's a little bit of extra multiplying going in with the function. Now, when people looked at these kinds of problems, they were sort of thinking, all right, we have to solve a differential equation. And so essentially, there's a derivative involved, so you have to integrate. And they, they sort of said, OK, what's easy to integrate? And an idea came. And they said, a derivative is easy to integrate. And that's the great aha. And this is how we're going to succeed in solving these types of differential equations. Namely, we're going to say, let's make it look like there's a derivative someplace. And then the integration will be pretty straightforward. Now, what's the part that's hard to integrate, by the way? Well, the part that's really hard to integrate is the stuff with the y's, because we don't know anything about the stuff with the y's. The things with the x's, OK, we have things we can do with them. So our real goal is to say, let's make this left-hand side look like a derivative. Now, we'll get into the specifics in a few moments, but it's sort of like wet our appetite. Let's see an example. OK, so here's an example. It starts by saying, what's the derivative with respect to x of x squared times y? Now, here, how do you think of y? It's always important to have context. And it says, well, think of y as being a function of x. So I have x squared, which is a function of x, times y, which is a function of x. So I have a product. So I need the product rule. So OK, great, we can do that. So for part a, we have that the derivative of x squared y. Well, it's the derivative of the first. Uh, well, let's do it the other way. The first function, x squared times the derivative of the second, well, that's y prime, right? Because the derivative of y is y prime. And then plus the derivative of the first times the second. All right. Well, all right. No big surprises. That's not, not too shocking. We've seen product rule before. We're pros at this point. All right. So let's go to part B. So part B says, OK, we want to find y given x squared y plus 2xy is 5 halves x to the 3 halves, and y of 1 is 2. And at this point, we're like, ah, that's a differential equation. That's a huge leap from part A to part B. But OK, they want to ask us something that we couldn't do. So we start looking at it, and we're saying, OK, uh, is there anything that relates back to part A? Because oftentimes, when you ask multiple parts, there's a connection going on. Well, we notice x squared y prime plus 2xy, x squared y prime plus 2xy. So the great aha says, look, part b, you can write this as the derivative of x squared y is equal to 5 halves x to the 3 halves. And now, you say, hey, that's a derivative. I know how to take an antiderivative of that, right? Because what's easy to integrate? A derivative. So now we integrate both sides. And the good news is, well, it's easy to integrate a derivative. So we should also, of course, throw in some dx's here. 
for good notation. And so we have x squared y. All right, what happens here? Well, 5 halves, x to 3 halves. You'd add 1 to the exponent, which would get you x to the 5 halves. Then you divide by 5 halves, which is the same as multiplying 2 fifths. So it becomes x to the 5 halves. And then, of course, plus c. All right, now what happens? Well, we're almost there. We've, we've actually done the hard work. We just need to plug in our initial conditions. So we can plug in y1 equals 2. That says, OK, when x equals 1, y equals 2. So we get that 2, that's 1 squared times 2, is equal to 1 to the 5 halves, which is 1, plus c. Well, OK, so c equals 1. All right, so x squared y is x to the 5 halves plus 1. Now divide by x squared, and we end up with y. Now x to the 5 halves divide by x squared. You'd subtract the exponents. 5 halves subtract 2 is 1 half. And then 1 over x squared is 1 over x squared, or right, we could write it as x to the negative 2 if we want. And we're done. We found y. And see, it wasn't bad. In fact, it was relatively straightforward because we knew how to handle the left-hand side. <clears throat> now, that brings us to part C. Okay, well, we can work part C over here. It says find y given xy prime plus 2y is 5 halves x to the 1 half and y of 1 equals 2. Now you look at this and say, well, now is this left-hand side a derivative? And the answer is no, it's not. But look at it. Look at it, right? It's really close to part B. And indeed, what happens in part C says, hey, if you multiply this whole equation, everything, both sides, by an x, then what happens? Well, you get x squared y prime plus 2xy equals 5 halves x to the 3 halves. And what we've done, we've modified it, but we've modified it in such a way that we get it back to something we can solve. And so we say, aha, same solution. And we're done, right? Because the initial value, that doesn't change by manipulating the differential equation. It's still the same initial value. And so that's our great aha. Now, what's going to happen, looking ahead, is essentially we're going to be given c. We know we're given the differential equation. And the question is, how do we find the right thing to multiply by? Let's talk about that idea. So that brings up the idea of what we call an integrating factor. And so the idea says, look, we're trying to, to make the left-hand side of this y prime plus p of xy look like a derivative. And so it may not be, so we have to manipulate. And the way we manipulate is we're going to multiply by some function called rho of x. And you say, all right, well, what's the right version? Well, what do we do? Well, okay, so you carry out the multiplication. So notice the difference between the original differential equation and the new one is you added a row of x. No worries. And you say, all right, we want the left-hand side to be a derivative. That's our goal, because derivatives are easy to integrate. And we say, all right, well, okay. Uh, if this were, in fact, a derivative, what would it be? Well, take the first times the root of the second plus the root of the first times the second. So that's our product rule. And, of course, we have what it should be equal to. And we look at it and say, okay, rho of x, y prime, rho of x, y prime, great. And then we say, well, rho prime of x times y, rho of x, p of x. Well, so that says we need this, rho prime is 
rho times p. Well, all right. Well, we can divide. Rho prime divided by rho is p. And now we channel our, our inner, what about this problem? Can we, can we solve? And yeah, we integrate both sides. And when you integrate, you'll notice upstairs is a prime. Downstairs is a row. So it's, it's, you can think of it as u downstairs, du upstairs. So that becomes log u, or log rho of x. So log rho of x is the integral p of x. And so if I want just the rho, I get it out of the log by using the exponential function. So this exp stands for exponential. So another way to write this is e to the integral p of x dx. All right. So great. That's the right thing. Now we have the way to multiply by. One small detail. And uh, I just want to note this because some people say, well, wait, 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 hold on. You integrated. When you integrate, what should you do? Well, you should have a plus c, right? Where, where is our plus c? And the answer is, we said, don't worry about it. We don't need to worry about it. And, uh, well, that might make you uncomfortable. So let's talk about why we don't need to worry about it. So why don't we need to worry about a plus c? So suppose we did. Suppose we did. If we had a plus c, that would tell us that rho of x is e to the integral p of x dx plus some constant c. All right, if you just worked it out. Which really says we can break this apart, e to the integral p of x, e to the c. So you have some constant e to the integral p of x dx. In other words, integrating factors are true up to a constant. Now, remember what happened is when we did the integrating factor, we multiplied everything by the same integrating factor. So if we were to do that with our d, what would happen is, well, you'd have a d and a d and a d. Everything has a d. Well, if everything has a d, what can you do? You can divide it out, and now it's gone. So the moral here is we can assume our constant is whatever we want. So uh, don't worry about the constant. That's the moral. So there we go. There we go. Now, we will get to a point when we do worry about the constant, but not when we're doing the integrating factor. OK, so let's work through the process now. And it goes as follows. The first step, well, or step zero, if you like, is make sure it's written in the right form. And when we talk about writing it in the right form, you really want to make sure that what's ever in front of that y prime is a 1. Because the next step depends on this being a 1. And if it's not, and you, you just sort of like, aha, let me put the p of x in, bad things happen. Okay, so make that a 1. And make sure the y prime and the p of x are on the same side. So you really want to write it in just this form. Okay, so now that we have it in our form, we say step one is find the integrating factor. And so we take our, our expression here, our differential equation, and we integrate that and take e to that. Now, on a side note, you often will encounter logs. So be ready for that. And in particular, be ready to know your properties of logs. So we want to make sure we understand how logs work. And uh, all right, so we found our integrating factor. We multiply both sides by integrating factor. And we automatically know that by design, 100% of the time, the left-hand side has become a derivative. The right-hand side has probably become something more complicated, but it only depends on x. Well, we have a derivative. Derivatives are easy to integrate, so we integrate both sides. So we have rho of x times y is the integral of this expression, rho of x, q of x, dx. And here's where you put in your constant. And now we've essentially done the hard part. We've done the integration 
that gets us down to just y. So we can get y by itself by dividing by our integrating factor, and if needed, we can solve for c. Now, you might say, oh, so all I have to do is memorize a few formulas, right? And I would discourage that. My tip is memorize the process because it's easy to get this process down because it has sort of a, a natural flow. And it's also easy to make a mistake when you try to memorize formulas because if you don't understand the formulas, you might grab the wrong formula or you might accidentally swap Q or P and then, ah, oh, troubles, troubles. So memorize the process. Write in the right form. Integrate what's in front of the y, take e to that. Simplify it because we're going to have to integrate again. You multiply both sides, you automatically know what the left-hand side looks like. So you get a nice integral on the left, you work through the integral on the right. I'm assuming that they asked you it, it's going to work out. And now you solve and life is good. Really, it's now just practice. Practice, practice, practice. And so, let's uh, do some practice. Our first example. Solve xy prime equals 2y plus x cubed cosine x. All right. Well, our, our first step is we want to rewrite it. Notice currently y prime and y are on different sides. So we're going to move the 2y across and there's an x in front of the y prime, so we're going to need to divide. We'll do that in two steps since we're just starting out. So I'll first subtract the 2y, so x y prime minus 2y, that's x cubed cosine of x, divide by x, y prime minus 2 over x y is equal to x squared cosine x. Now, you may start getting nervous about that right-hand side saying, oh, I'm not looking forward to integrating that. Hold off. Don't be nervous yet. You know, it might not be a pleasant integral, but we aren't done yet because we still have to do the integrating factor. And if we're lucky, the integrating factor has been set up to make things easier. So we're ready. So we now say, what is our P of X? It's what's in front of the y. Don't forget about the sign. So if it's being subtracted, you want that sign. So this is our p of x. And so what we're going to do is we're going to integrate that. So the integral of p of x, well, that's the integral of minus 2 over x. And that makes that minus 2 log x. By properties of logs, because remember, we need to know our properties of logs. We can put that minus 2 inside. So this is the same as log of x to the minus 2. And also remember, at this stage, we don't need to worry about our constants. Now, that's not our integrating factor. Our integrating factor is when we take e to that. So e to the integral, p of x dx. So this is our rho of x. That is e to the natural log of x to the minus 2, which is why we took some time to write it as natural log, because e and natural log automatically will undo each other. So this becomes x to the minus 2, or if you like, 1 over x squared. All right, good. Now, we found our integrating factor. We multiply everything by 1 over x squared. So if we do that, we're going to have 1 over x squared y prime minus 2 over x cubed y is equal to, well now the x squares and the 1 over x squares cancel, cosine of x. We don't have to think about this left-hand side. That's 100% automatic. We already know what this is. This is guaranteed, unless we made a mistake, to be the derivative of our integrating factor, 1 over x squared, times our function y. And now we're like, good, yes, ha, ah, we can feel it. Because we say, aha, what's easy to integrate? A derivative, good. So 
we integrate both sides. So we're going to integrate now both sides. And what's going to happen? Well, on the left, we get 1 over x squared times y. On the right, the integral of cosine is sine. I saw the sign, and it opened up my eyes. I saw the sign. All right, and now we need our plus c. Finally, I want to solve uh, for y, just because I have a tendency to do that. It's just a habit I got into. It didn't explicitly say solve for y, but for first order, I think it's a good habit to do. And if we multiply, we'll see, lo and behold, our answer, y is x squared sine of x plus some constant c x squared. And we're done. That's it. That's the whole process. See? That's not bad. That's not bad at all. Of course not. We just need to practice it. And uh, so that's what we're doing. Okay, well, hmm, perhaps we should see more examples. So here's another example. y prime is 3 plus y tangent of x. And uh, let's go ahead and run through our process. Now, what can we do? We can write this if we distribute the tangent of x through. y prime is 3 tangent of x plus y tangent of x. All right, good. And we want to put the y prime and y on the same side. So we move that y tangent x across. So y prime subtract y tangent of x uh, is equal to 3 tangent of x. But uh, we should, of course, write this in a, in a better way. So I'll do that here. Instead of y times tangent of x, we'll write it as tangent of x y, just to emphasize so we have no problem spotting what is our p of x. We already see that there's a 1 in front of the y prime. Nice. And so we say, OK, this minus tangent of x, here's our p of x. And so we start doing our computation. The integral of p of x, well, that's the integral of minus tangent of x dx. And the nice thing about tangent is we know the integral for that. And the integral for that is log of secant. Now, notice the minus sign in the front of log. We can put that minus sign inside. And so log secant, if you move it to the inside, that's log secant to the minus 1. That's not arc secant. It means 1 over secant. Well, what do you get when you do 1 over secant? You get cosine. 1 over cosine is secant, so 1 over secant is cosine. So we see, aha, this is log cosine x. Now, our integrating factor will be e to that integral p of x dx, which is e to the natural log of cosine x. And uh, you probably think, wow, for the second time, a lot? Yeah, it happens a lot. A lot, a lot. So it's not that surprising. All right, so that says the integrating factor is cosine x. OK, so everything's going to get multiplied by a cosine of x. All right, so when we do that, what do we have? Well, we have the following. We're going to get cosine of x times y prime. OK, that's no problem. And then tangent times cosine. Now, tangent is sine over cosine. So in tangent times cosine, we just have sine. So minus sine of x times y is equal to, on the other side, 3 sine of x. Similar idea. Tangent times cosine is sine. Now, you say, OK, what happens? Well, by design, 100% guaranteed, we know the left-hand side. 
We don't even have to think about it. It's automatic. So the left-hand side is the derivative of our ingrain factor, cosine of x, this piece, times y. Now you can always check that, right? Do the product rule. The first times the root of the second, so cosine times y. The root of the first is negative sine times the second. It's always going to work. And if it doesn't, mistakes were made. If you think mistakes may have been made, this is a great place to stop and check. It doesn't hurt to check your work. And indeed, five out of five dentists, everybody, says you should check your work. All right. Well, now we say, aha, it's easy to integrate a derivative. So we're going to integrate both sides with respect to x. All right. So what does that give us? Well, it, it gives us the following. Namely, we have on the left, cosine of x times y is equal to, now here, what's the integral of sine? It's minus cosine. So that's minus 3 cosine of x, and then plus c. Okay, now divide through by cosine, we get that y is minus 3 plus c divide by cosine. But divide by cosine, 1 over cosine, is the same as multiply by secant. So negative 3 plus some constant c, secant x. Now, we need to satisfy an initial condition. y of 0 equals 2. All right, so y of 0 equals 2. What does that tell us? Well, it tells us that 2 is negative 3, because I put in y equals 2. Negative 3 becomes 3, because it was always 3 to begin with. Now, secant of 0. Well, you may have to think about this one. Now, remember, secant is 1 over cosine. Cosine of 0 is 1, and so secant of 0 1 over 1 is 1. And so it's c times 1. Aha! That says c has to be 5. Right, but you add 3 to both sides. So we end up with our answer. Negative 3 plus 5 secant x. Okay. Done. Done. Now, before we leave this problem, I can't help but notice we have an awful lot of space here. So let's go ahead and uh, do it a second time. Because if you look at this, what do you see? This type of problem actually is not just a first order linear differential equation, it's also separable. You see, we can separate this out. What do you think will happen if we try to solve it as a separable differential equation? Now, will we get the same answer? Will we not? Let's find out, right? We should do that and, uh, and see what happens. Okay, so separating, think of this as dy over dx is equal to 3 plus y tangent x, and now we have dy over 3 plus y is equal to tangent of x dx. So we've separated. And after we separate, what comes next? Well, the next thing is you integrate. So OK, we integrate both sides. Great. What does that give us? Well, the integral of dy over 3 plus y would be natural log of 3 plus y. Integral of tangent is natural log of secant. And of course, add a constant c. You put both sides into the exponential function, and we end up with 3 plus y is equal to secant of x. But now, that, that plus c there becomes a times c in the front, right? Because this is e to the log secant, e to the c. 
And e to a constant is a constant. And so, oh, oh, okay. Or, in particular, we have the following, namely that y is negative 3 plus some constant c secant of x. And the rest of this is the same, because notice we got that same general form. Now, is it a coincidence that we got the same answer? No. No, it's not. And one of the things that this shows you is that there are some problems where there are multiple ways to solve it. And you'll get the right answer as long as the process is carried out correctly in both cases. So which one's the right way? Well, there's not a right or wrong way. In some sense, it's a matter of which way are you more comfortable with and oftentimes that's the way you should go. And so be open. Look for options saying, how can I do this? Do I have options? And sometimes options are good. Sometimes it doesn't matter. But now we know. And knowing is half the battle. So now to our next example. Solve 1 minus 4xy squared y prime equals y cubed. Now, before we read anything else, let's just stop there and say, this isn't linear. There's very nonlinear things going on here. Why is there nonlinear? Y cubed? Y squared? This is madness. No, 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 it's not madness, but it, it's not the easiest thing to work with. And it's, it's not a linear. But we haven't finished reading the problem, so let's not panic. Well, let's reserve our panic, perhaps. By rephrasing this as a differential equation in terms of x prime. I'm like, oh, what? Can we do that? OK, so let's talk about this. So this is saying, you know, you have this y prime, which was what? Well, it's the change in y with respect to x. So this is when we think of y as being a function of x. But we can turn it around and say, well, we could also think of x as being a function of y. So I could say x prime is the change in x with respect to y. All right, so let's look at these two expressions. How does y change with respect to x? How does x change with respect to y? And how are these related one to another? Well, if you look, and you don't have to look for very long, you'll see these feel like they're like upside down from each other. Yes, they are. Good. You've cracked the code. So if I'm looking at how these relate one to another, there's the great aha that says, oh, I can say that y prime is 1 over x prime. Okay, so let's put this in so that we can rephrase it in terms of x prime. All right, so here we go. 1 minus 4xy squared times 1 over x prime is equal to y cubed. Or we could say 1 minus 4xy squared is y cubed x prime. Let's pause here. Looking at this now, x is a function of y. So we're thinking this as a derivative in terms of x. Notice that there's an x prime and an x. And that's it, right? That's the only way x shows up. And so from the perspective of this as a differential equation of x, it's linear. And so we're like, oh, our tools apply. Now there's an underlying question that you have saying, OK, it told us to do that. How would I know to do this if I saw one out in the wild? I was out hiking, and I saw this differential equation. How would I know to even think about this? Well, I'll be honest with you. This is not an easy thing to automatically see. So don't worry too much about getting that, that sort of sixth sense of how to identify these things. There are some clues. And namely, the, the clue is there's lots of y stuff going on. Lots of y stuff going on. And the more y stuff that there is, the more like, Ugh. there's 
very small amounts of X stuff. And the less there is, there's like, ah. And that's sort of the clue. It's just to say, oh, as it is right now, it's very simple with respect to the X. So if I can rephrase it in terms of the X, maybe there's a chance. As I said, don't worry about identifying it. If you ever need to do it, we'll tell you to do it. Okay, so we still have to finish this problem. But that's all right. We've sort of have worked through the hard parts. We'll move the x term across. So this will give us our y cubed x prime plus, all right, as 4y squared x is equal to 1. And I want to write this in particular, you know, something x prime, something x. We want to get a 1 in front of the x prime. So we say, okay, no problem. Divide through by y cubed. So x prime plus here 4 over y times x is equal to 1 over y cubed. All right. Now we're ready to go into our integrating factor. We don't start our integrating factor until we have a 1 in front of our x prime and x prime and x are on the same side. So, we look for what's in front. So in this case, it's p of y. We say, all right, we integrate that. So the integral four over y dy is, well, that's four natural log y, which is natural log of y to the fourth. This is one of the things that you sort of have to get your brain to reset, right? You're so used to saying like, oh, y comes here, x goes there. And now we're like, well, no, x is here, and y is there. Like, what? But remember, these are all symbols. It's okay. It's same processes. Don't get hung up on that. All right. So our row of x, which is e to the integral of p of x, sorry, p of y. Ah, I just talked about it, and I made that mistake. See? You just have to be careful. Don't rush yourself, and you get y to the fourth. So multiply everything by y to the fourth, you get y to the fourth, x prime plus 4y cubed x is equal to y. And by design, it has to happen that this is the derivative with respect to y of y to the fourth times x. And now we're ready. We say, aha, Left-hand side, super easy to integrate. And now we just integrate the right-hand side. And if we do that, we get that y to the fourth times x is equal to 1 half y squared plus, of course, some constant c. Or if we divide through by x, we could leave it here. I think this is fine. Or we could say, look, that's the same as saying x equals, we divide through by y to the fourth, 1 over 2y squared plus some constant c over y to the fourth. Both are fine. Both are fine. Both are solutions. In this case, x is a function of y instead of y is a function of x, but no worries. Life is good. Our final problem is a nice introduction to a type of problem that shows up a lot and falls into the camp of linear first order equations. And that's mixing problems. And so the way you should think about a mixing problem is that you have some sort of a tank. So we don't have to be very fancy in our drawing. So we just draw a tank. We'll even add the word tank so that it's very easy for us to see that it's a tank. And then what's happening is something's coming into the tank and something's coming out of the tank. And the question is, what's happening to the contents? And we're going to assume that our tank is what we call well mixed. So there's some sort of motor that's spinning things around, and uh, so the contents of the tank are always nicely well mixed. Okay, so that's the idea. So let's start by reading the problem, and we'll fill in details. 
So we have a 120 gallon tank. Initially, it contains 90 ounces of salt and it's dissolved in 90 gallons of water. So the tank isn't full yet. So, so at time zero, well, because it's initially we think of as time zero, so at t equals zero, there are 90 gallons and there's of brine. And brine is just a fancy way of saying salt water, right? Because there's water and salt. And so there's 90 ounces of salt. Okay, so that's some information. So brine, salt water, that contains two ounces per gallon of salt flows into the tank at a rate of four gallons per minute. So there's two things that we know. We know a rate you know, how much is entering in. So it's coming in at four gallons per minute. And we know a concentration. How much does this fluid that's coming in, how much salt does it have? Now, by the way, it doesn't have to be salt, but oftentimes salt is very harmless. So we don't mind using it as our example. Two ounces per gallon. All right. And the well-stirred mixture flows out of the tank at the rate of three gallons per minute. So that's down here. So this is three gallons per minute. <clears throat> and so now we have our setup. We know how big our tank is. We know how much is happening initially. We know how things are coming in. We know how things are going out. The goal is find S of T. The amount of salt in the tank at time T where time goes from zero to 30. Now, what's missing here? You'll notice we had a concentration coming in. We do not have a concentration going out. Was that an oversight? No. Uh, the problem here is that the concentration will change. So as salt comes in, it might make the contents more or less salty and so how much uh, salt there is per gallon will vary with time. So we have to sort of figure this out. That's one of our, our challenges. What are some other things we should notice? Well, why was it saying for time from zero to 30? Why stop at 30? So let's think about what's happening here. We have four gallons are coming in. So four gallons are coming in three gallons are coming out. So four in, three out. Well, what do you notice? There's more coming in than going out. So what's that gonna mean? Well, it means that you're gonna start going up. So at every minute, you get an additional gallon. Now, how much space do we have? There's a capacity of 120. We already had 90, so we can't go forever because we only have 30 gallons left. So that's why our time goes from zero to 30. And that's uh, a condition imposed by the problem. Okay, so that explains what's going on there. Well, where do we begin? It comes down, no surprise, to setting up a differential equation. And what's gonna be the differential equation? Well, it's gonna be about our salt. So we're gonna ask a simple question. How is our salt changing? Because the goal of the class of differential equations is to say, to say, oh, sometimes it's easier to think about how things change than it is to think about what they are. And so how is the salt changing? Well, it's changing in the following ways. We have some that comes in and we have some that goes out. And the salt that comes in, that increases it, you add it, the salt that goes out, that decreases it, you subtract it. That's the idea. Isn't that simple? It is. It is simple. Ah, okay, so can we figure out one of these? Well, let's tackle the in. We know we have four gallons per minute. We know that there are two ounces per gallon. You multiply four times two. You'll notice the gallons cancel, and we're left with what? Eight eight ounces per minute. So the N is the easy part, the vast majority of the time. 
How about the out? Well, okay, so how can we think about the out? There's a couple of ways to think about it. But let's think about what we did here. We said, well, we, we had a flow, in this case four, and a concentration, and you multiply them together. So we have a flow, three. So let's start by saying, okay, it's the flow, three. And now we have to do the other part, which is the concentration. So flow times concentration gives us what we need. Now, how do you find the concentration? Well, you take the total amount of salt in the tank, how many ounces there are, divide it by how much brine there is, you know, how many gallons of liquid is there. So, do we have something that tells us how much salt is in the tank? Yes. It's called S. S is the amount of salt in the tank. Okay, so we have an S upstairs. Now, do we know how much liquid there is in the tank? At time zero, it's 90, and we know it's going up. And we, we, how much is it going up? It goes up by one gallon each minute. And so, we have 90 gallons plus one times T. So this one is the difference between four and three. And we've set up our differential equation. There we go. We have the in, and we have the out. And it's linear, right? Because you see S prime and S. Meaning we have the tools to solve this. So let's solve it. We can move this part across. So we have that S prime plus, and I'll rewrite this as three over T plus 90 times S is equal to eight. And we're ready to go. We grab what's in front of our S, because we already have a one, life is good there. So here is our P of X. In our case, this is P of T. And so we are gonna find our rho integrating factor, which is e to the integral of three over t plus 90 dt. Okay, so that's e to the, well, okay, three is a constant. One over t plus 90 is natural log t plus 90. And so this becomes e to the natural log of t plus 90 cubed, which is t plus 90 cubed. Good, All right? Because e and natural log undo each other. Okay, so we say, great, we're going to multiply both sides of this equation by t plus 90 cubed. And if we do that, what's going to happen is the left-hand side, we automatically know, is going to be the derivative of our integrating factor, t plus 90 cubed times s. And the right-hand side is going to be, well, whatever it turns out to be. That's 8 times t plus 90 cubed. And we are in our happy place, right? Because what do we see? We see that we have a derivative, and derivatives are easy to integrate. So we're now going to integrate. So we integrate both sides with respect to t. Whoops, I can write a better integral sign there. And uh, that tells us that t plus 90 cubed times s, level of salt, is equal to here. Well, I, I can just do a general power rule because it, or you can do substitution. And uh, essentially, it's like t cubed. The, the plus 90 doesn't do anything. So you would add 1, that makes it 4, divide by 4. So that's 2 times t plus 90 to the 4th, and of course, plus c. All right, good, good. Now, what comes next? Well, 
uh, we can we can solve for s. Say okay. So we get that s is dividing through. We'll have two times t plus 9d to the one, and then plus some constant c over t plus 9d cubed. Now, are we done? And why not? Well, unfortunately, we're not done, even though we're running a little tight on space, but that's okay, because we want to make sure we get the whole thing. What haven't we incorporated yet? There's one piece of information we haven't used. We have definitely have used the rate in and the rate out in a couple of places. We've used the concentration in, that showed up in the eighth. We've used how much there was at the beginning, because that shows up here at that 90. We haven't used this part. What does this say? At time zero, there's 90 ounces of salt. This condition tells us that S of zero is 90. So we need to use that to solve for C. So we plug it in. So we have that 90, right? Because plug in at time zero, we have 90 is equal to 2 times 90 plus some constant C over 90 cubed. Well, we can, of course, subtract. And what do we get? Well, we get the following. If I take 90 and I subtract 2 times 90, that's negative 90 is equal to C over 90 cubed. Or we can say that C is negative 90 to the fourth. Okay, so our final answer. I think we can squeeze it in. The amount of salt at any given time t is equal to 2 over t, sorry, 2 times t plus 90 minus 90 to the fourth over t plus 90 cubed. Whew. We barely got it on the page, but we fit it in. There we go. So that is the solution. That's capturing how much salt there is in the tank at any given time from zero to 30. And so if we wanted to, we could say how much is in there when the tank is full, plug in 30. But that feels like a calculator question, not a, a non-calculator question. So for us, we'll just stop here. All right, done.